1929, the Bronx, New York. September, William Lambert arrives in a hospital in New York. His mother arrives two hours later. Let's go, let's get this birthing over. New York City, the Great Depression. <sighs> Life was difficult for a Jewish family in the Bronx. Four years later, young William sends his father out to California to see if a better life can be had there. Israel Lambert likes what he sees and sends for his family. Helen, William, and young Fredo. 1933, Los Angeles. The depression is still on, but it's sunny and warm and so no one feels all that bad about it. Israel Lambert has given up his career as a pharmacist and has gone to work for his brother-in-law, Mark C. Bloom. Young William grows up. In California, another sibling arrives, Francis. The family moves to the Alfred Street compound in the mid-1930s. Coincidentally, just as in the Bronx, this turns out to be a predominantly Jewish enclave. Young William goes to Laurel Elementary, where he immediately begins organizing students and collecting dues. The principal finds out and William is transferred to Rosewood Elementary. Soon he gains the eraser clapper concession and also does well in spelling. His budding sports career has not gone so well. He is on the Little League team, but due to a disagreement with the league commissioner, he has persuaded his team to sit out the season. By the time the strike is settled, William is in high school and is considered too old for t-ball. His brother Fred Lambert remembers Bill growing up. He liked to play ping pong. And I like to play ping pong. You know, we were good players in our day, and but I always beat him. And every time I beat him, he would take the paddle and shoot it across the table. Hence, we could call the game 21 Duck because I yelled 21 and I duck as the paddle came flying across and would sever your head if you looked up. Had a terrible temper, didn't like to lose. But that was Bill as a kid. Bill, growing up, was very famous for this flurry temper. And, and uh, that's why they say you grow up, you lose it. And he did. But when he was a kid, he was hard to live with. The youthful Bill is not like other children. Too restless for nap time, he arranges to spend those 30 minutes working in a lumber mill. This is the first of many jobs. Fairfax High in Los Angeles. William proves to be a stellar student and quite popular. Bill authors a weekly column about the military and titles it Eyes Right. After the editor shot down his original name, You're All Wrong. And what type of older brother was William? His sister Frances has these comments. Bill was a great older brother. I never took a bus. He always picked me up. He always took care of me. And I was terrified of him. When you were sick and you needed to take medicine uh, and it tasted so awful, who gave it to you? Bill gave it to you because you wouldn't tell him no. He was, he was a very, very good brother, but he was tough. We used to have to bring him toast at night. He went to bed at night, and Fred and I used to make him toast and bring it to him. He's still a good brother. He's always took care of me. By the time of his graduation, he will have joined 18 clubs and organizations and is president of 15. Yet he finds time to work full-time at the gas station in addition to some part-time jobs. Well, he graduated high school, found out that you could go in the Army, so he talks three of his friends into joining with him. So the four of them go down, they're all get processed, and they send him to Fort MacArthur in uh, San Pedro. In the morning when he wakes up, the first morning there, they give him a physical, and they said, do you have anything? He said, I have asthma. And they said, asthma, we don't want you. So he got four up and they sent him home. The other three guys go in the service. Uh, and so Bill, here he goes in the army, he says, one day he's back home. His friends incidentally sent him threatening letters because they were in the army and they were going through hell. But it turned out that they were really, really saved by Bill because they did one year of duty 
and then the next year the Korean War started and those guys were out and they didn't have to go. Then he's going to go to college, he's going to go to the University of Colorado and we throw a big party and he's, um, I think he went to the University of Colorado for, for three days and didn't like it, came back. The college years. William lettered in both poker and miniature golf. He graduated from UCLA with a degree in history, which opened up the doors to a promising career at the Bloom Tire Station. William was thus inspired to enroll at LA City College, get his teaching degree, and start his life's work. The education of America's youngins with no child left behind. William took control of his first classroom in September 1955, an elementary school in Pacoima. Here is Miles, a favorite student from one of his first classes. He was a fair but demanding teacher. Um, at first, I was nervous learning about the union organizing in the sixth grade. But Mr. Lambert said that one day I'd appreciate the importance of collective bargaining. William, now known as Mr. Lambert, was a dedicated teacher. His duties as a teacher did not end with the school bell. He organized after-school events and camping trips. Well, we set up our tents, and Mr. Lambert cooked over the campfire. Then he had us clean up the entire forest and put out a wildfire. I remember it was fun, but tired. At Montague Elementary, he also learned his first lessons about school politics and administration. I get a job teaching fourth and fifth grade at Montague Elementary, and I spend about three weeks getting my classroom ready because I'm going to be the world's greatest teacher. And the first day of teaching in the middle of the morning, my principal walks into my room and says, Mr. Lambert, and I said, yes. She said, welcome to Montague Street School. By the way, I'm looking at your bulletin boards. Do you realize you have red paper on your bulletin boards? And I said, yes. She said, do you know red paper is a warm color? And I said, yes. She said, and warm excites kids. I said, isn't that what we're supposed to do? She said, not in Montague Street. So I spent the next four or five days and put in brown paper and she came back at the end of the week and she had a ruler in her hand. And she said, Mr. Lambert, she said, do you know that the tag board uh, and the construction paper, there's a half an inch border? And I said, yes, that's half an inch. She said, not at Montague, we use a quarter of an inch. So I took it down and I made it a quarter of an inch. A week later, I uh, got a notice that all the upper grade teachers were having a meeting with the upper grade supervisor on bulletin boards. And so we all um, had a meeting and it lasted about an hour and a half after school and somewhere in that meeting I raised my hand and said to the uh, supervisor, I said, you know, I said, if I do all the things that you tell me to do, I said, when do I have time to grade papers, prepare lessons, work with kids and do all of those other things? That got me a see me after school notice from the principal. So I saw her after school the next day and she said, Mr. Lambert, we don't ask embarrassing questions to supervisors like that. And by the way, she said, do you belong to an organization? And I said, what's an organization? She said, well, we have some organizations and you should join one. And there was one called ATOLA, the Affiliated Teachers. She said, you should join the Probationary and Substitute Teacher Organization. So I go about my business, and two months later, I get a call from uh, one of the board members of PSTO, a woman by the name of Dorothy Mealy. She says, is this Bill Lambert? And I said, yeah. She said, you know you're on the board of directors of PSTO? I said, yeah, I got a letter. It says I'm on the board. She said, you know you're supposed to come to meetings. I said, you have meetings? She said, yeah. She said, would you come and, uh, and lead the flag salute? I said, that's good. I know the flag salute. So I went to the meeting, and... Uh, I did a good job on the flag salute, and a year later I was president of PSTO. And then the affiliated teachers, which was a big organization, they uh, they were electing uh, their uh, their uh, board of directors too. And so, as the president of PSTO, I went to the meeting. The guy sitting behind me, and he tapped me on the back, and he said, uh, "Lambert, is that you?" And I said, "Yeah." He said, "You want to be vice president of ATOLA?" I said, "Why not?" He stood up and he said, I nominate Bill Lambert, Vice President of ATOLA. And everybody looked around and said, who is he? So I stood up and I sat down after a while and uh, after the caucuses were over, I was also Vice President of ATOLA.
At this time, Bill decided to settle down, get married, raise a family, and give up one of his paper routes. My family and Bill's family had a mutual friend. My sister-in-law, Judy's mother, Evelyn Nagler. She was the matchmaker of um, uh, Los Angeles, I think, in those days. So she gave Bill a list of seven or eight women who he thought, she thought he would like to meet. Well, this one smoked, that one drank, this one he didn't care for for some other reason. Meanwhile, I figured that it, whoever she was pushing was not likely to be somebody I'd be terribly interested in. Bill called. We talked for um, about maybe 45 minutes on the phone. And then he decided it might be worthwhile for us to meet. So he said, I'll pick you up and I'll take you to Norm's restaurant on a Thursday night at 8 o'clock and we'll have coffee. Figuring that um, if he wanted to get rid of me, Norm's restaurant was only about five minutes from the apartment where I was living at the time and uh, wouldn't take too long to get back. So much to our surprise, we liked each other and the rest was history. Although Bill enjoyed giving his students jobs to do and having them right on the board, Mr. Lambert is always right. He began to sense a higher calling, the formation of a union, more specifically, the Los Angeles Teachers Association. A former colleague and co-conspirator spoke on condition of anonymity. Well, we were pretty much ready with our bomb-making equipments and to set ourselves on fire. But Bill convinced us that organizing and negotiating might work. So we gave that a chance. The union grows and merges with another small union to form UTLA, the United Teachers of Los Angeles. At first, UTLA concentrates on souvenirs, developing a complete line of clothing, including more than a thousand t-shirt designs. But success in the apparel industry is not enough, for UTLA faces its first major dilemma. How do we get Bill Lambert out of our hair two or three days a week? The answer, make him a lobbyist. Bill begins going to Sacramento. Sacramento in the 1960s was a small western outpost. Bill stays a few blocks from the capital at the Ponderosa, formerly the home to Haas and Little Joe. This ranch house has been converted to a motel. From this base of operations, Bill will reshape the politics of education in California for the next 40 years. string sitting on a rainbow got the string around my finger what a world what a life I'm in love I got a song that I sing I can make the rain go anytime I move my finger Lucky me, can't you see I'm in love? Life is a beautiful thing As long as I hold the string I'd be a silly so-and-so If I should ever let it go I got the world on a string Sitting on a rainbow Got the string around my finger What a world, what a life I'm in love Life is a beautiful thing As long as I hold the string I'd be a silly so-and-so If I should ever let it go I got the world on a string Sitting on a rainbow Got the string around my finger What a world Man, this is a lie Hey now 